Ivy LA program. My name is Ruby and today we will be talking about global businesses. And these are the topics we will be touching on. First, let's get to know the World Trade Organization or also called the WTO. Um, they are located in Switzerland and was established in January 1st of 1995. And they were created by the Uruguay Round Negotiations. There are 164 countries um, as of July 29th in 2016 and to join the WTO, a government has to bring its economic and trade policies in line with the WTO rules and negotiate its terms of entry with the WTO membership. The budget for them um, in 2020 was approximately 220 million US dollars with 625 secretariat staff and the head is Ngozi Okwanjo Iwela. And their functions, the functions of the WTO is to administer trade agreements, forum for trade negotiations, handling trade disputes, monitoring national trade policies, technical assistance and training for developing countries, and cooperating with other international organizations. Now about the WTO agreements, um, how many agreements have been signed, Anne? Well, I remember there are a few types of agreements on uh, sensitive goods. Uh, let me list a few. Uh, agreement on agriculture, agreement on sanitary and phytosanitary measures, and agreement on textile and clothing. There are also some uh, other agreements in the area of technical barriers, such as, such as agreements on technical barriers to trade, um, agreements on trade-related investments measures, and agreements on implementations of anti-dumping. Mm, and this one, would you like to add? Yes, there are some tasks and incentive agreements such as agreements on implementation of custom variations, agreements on pre-shipments inspections, agreement on rules of origins, agreement on import licensing procedures, agreements on subsidized and countervailing measures. Yes, and what are some of the general agreements, Turin? Yes, general agreements are especially important uh, services, such as an agreements on safeguards. Uh, general agreement on trade and services, uh, agreements on trade related to the aspect of uh, intellectual property rights. This including in the trade and counterfeit and goods. Oh yeah, um, especially the dispute resolution mechanism that is understanding the rules and procedures in governing the settlement of disputes. Yeah, so on the topic of the general agreement on trade and tariffs, which is also called the GATT, let's talk about their major principles about tariffs based on restrictions, most favored nation treatment, national treatment, and reciprocity. And on global business, I see there are opposing opinions about it. So what are some cons and what are some pros and cons? What's name? About globalization and pros, increase international trade and cross-border investments, lower price for goods and service, mm -hmm. economic growth rates in the income of customer. Okay, and, and how will this help with the jobs um, in certain countries? Oh, well, uh, it will help create jobs in uh, all countries that uh, free trade results in countries specializing in production. Oh, okay, now those were some pros. And John, can you tell us maybe a con? All right, so some cons for the globalizations. Um, falling trade barriers allow firms to move their manufacturing activities offshore to countries where wage rates are much lower. So it increases in, it increases inter interdependent global economy. And, and uh, these causes uh, economic power to shift away from national government and towards uh, uh, organizations such as the World Trade uh, Organization and the European Union and the United Nations. That's right. Um, now let's talk about the level of economic integration. These are all right. One called free trade areas, which means that all trade barriers between members of the countries are eliminated. 
And there are also custom unions where customs union eliminates the trade barriers between members of countries and adopts a common external trade policy to oversee trade relations with non-members. Uh, common market uh, is the factors of production, labor and capital. These are free to move between uh, members because there are no restrictions and on immigration uh, immigration or, or cross-border flows of capital between members and countries. Economic unions also requires a common currencies and fiscal policies. Yes, and lastly, a political union are the parliaments, commissions, and the councils that play important roles in the EU. And um, in global business, uh, we generally talk about the market economy, which are all productive activities that are privately owned. And production is determined by the interaction of supply and demand. Through the mechanisms of price systems determine that what is produced and in what quality or quantity, the role of government is to encourage competition between private producers. And private ownership ensures that entrepreneurs have a right to the profits generated by their own efforts. In globalization forces, we have home demand, uh, development in communication technology, improvement in transportation industry, less uh, restrictive trading policies, technological change, and last but not least, multilateral and bilateral trading treaties. So in the Instruments of Trade Policies, Turin, which you... Uh, yes, uh, Instrument of Trade Policy includes tariff, uh, subsidies, uh, imports and quota, and voluntary export restraints. Mm -hmm. And anything else? Um, there are also um, some instruments of the trade policies also. Um, there are local content requirements, anti-dumping policies, administrative policies. Mm. And what about the strategies for penetrating global markets, guys? First, I think global trade is included. Exporting, importing, foreign buying agents, piggy bank marketing, foreign distributor, salary representatives. Yeah. Well, second is licensing. Uh, this includes intellectual property, yes. Yeah, so trade secrets, know hows, trademarks, and copyrights. Uh, this is called international franchising. Oh yeah, um, and adding on to that, the third one for a strategy that could penetrate global markets is direct investment. Um, what do you think, I mean, why do you think people use direct investment, Anne? Well, the direct investment is most relevant when the target market is isolated by restrictive import barriers or high transportation costs. And direct investment offers more control and a greater share of potential profits. That's true. Location advantage for establishing new manufacturing facility. Yeah. And uh, environmental laws and uh, labor laws or other restrictions imposed by both countries. Um, yeah, I also think that manufacturing facilities around the world as part of the strategy to, pre to like spread risks is also very important in direct investment. And um, let's dive into investment legal issues, which are a wide variety of legal issues, um, including... Uh, location of facilities. Yes. Yeah, labor laws, import licensing requirements. Yeah. Also import tariffs. Uh -huh. And percentage by value of parts used in assembling its final products. Yeah, I think all these are all in the legal issues. Um, and on investment methods, there are some. Um, there is a variety of methods we can use, which include overseas branching, um, wholly owned subsidiary. Uh, with acquisitions and greenfield investment, joint ventures, and now to learn more about what we discussed, let's uh, let's look at a case study. Let's look at the case of Republic of Argentina v. Weldover. Facts: Since Argentina's currency is not one of the mediums of exchange accepted in the international market. Argentinian businesses engaging in global transactions must pay in U.S. dollars or some other internationally accepted currency. In the recent past, it was difficult for Argentinian borrowers to obtain such funds 
principally because of the instability of the Argentinian currency. To address these problems, the Republic of Argentina instituted a foreign exchange insurance contract program called the FEIC, under which Argentina effectively agreed to assume the risk of currency depreciation in cross-border transactions involving Argentinian borrowers. This was accomplished by Argentina's agreeing to sell a domestic borrowers in exchange for a contractually predetermined amount of local currency. The necessary U.S. dollars to repay their foreign debts when matured, irrespective of intervening devaluations. Unfortunately, Argentina did not possess sufficient reserves of U.S. dollars to recover the EFIC contracts as they become due. It then adopts certain emergency measures, including refinancing contracts as a, of the FEIC-backed debts by issuing to the creditors government bonds. These bonds provided tip, uh, for payment of interest and principal in U.S. dollars. Under the refinancing program, the foreign creditor would either accept the bonds in um, satisfaction of the initial debt, whereby substituting the Argentinian government for the private debtor relationship with the private borrower and accept the Argentinian government as a guarantor. When the bonds began to mature, Argentina concluded it lacked sufficient foreign exchange to retire them. Pursuant to a presidential decree, Argentina unilaterally extended the time for payment and offered bondholders substitute instrument as a means of rescheduling the debts. Several bondholders refused to accept the rescheduling and demanded full payments. Argentina did not pay and the bondholders filed a breach of contract suit in the U.S. District Court. Now, the issue is, should the U.S. court dismiss the suit on the basis of sovereign immunity? John, would you like to start us off? Um, no. So when a foreign government acts not as a regulator of a market, but in the manner of a privately player within it, the foreign sovereign actions are commercial within the means of the FSIA. Okay, and? Well, because, of, uh, because the FSIA provides the commercial character of an act, to be determined by the reference to its nature rather than its purpose. The question is not whether the government is acting with a profit's motive or instead with the arming of fulfilling unique sovereign objectives. Ms. Mm -hmm. uh, Wang, what do you think? I think it's no. The issue is whether the particular actions that the state performs are the type of actions by which a private party engaged in the trade and tariff Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to add on is uh, a foreign government insurance of regulations limited its foreign currency exchange, which means it's a sovereign activities because such uh, authoritative control of the commerce cannot be exercised by a private party. Uh, whereas a contract to buy an arm, uh, boost, uh, or even bullets is commercial activity because private companies can similarly use sales contract to acquire such goods. Oh, yeah, thank you for that discussion. I agree. Um, and so the question of should the U.S. court dismiss the suit on the basis of sovereign immunity, we all came to a conclusion of no, because under the Foreign Sovereign Immunity Act or FSIA, a foreign state is immune from the jurisdiction of the U.S. courts unless one of the salutarily defined exceptions applies. The most significant of these is the commercial exception. The commercial character of these bonds is confirmed by the fact that they are, in almost all respects, garden variety debt instruments. They may help a private parties, but they are negotiable and may be traded on the international market and also they promise a future stream of cash income. It is relevant why Argentina participated in the bond market in the manner of a private actor, so it matters only that it did so. Any questions? Okay, that's it. Thank you to the IBLA and especially Dr. Sun.